Welcome to the Resilient Campus Podcast, amplifying the voices of college inclusion innovators. I'm your host, Sabby Labor, founder and CEO of Resilient Campus. Join me each week as I interview professionals on the front lines of campus and community movement building. For more information, please visit resilientcampus.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the final installment of the three-part recording of episode 31, uh, which was a discussion that took place at the Transforming Higher Education Collaborative convening, which was a think tank of sorts that took place in Tucson, Arizona about nine months ago. And it featured about nine different folks of various trans experiences and was quite a remarkable convening. And in this episode, we continue the discussion in which in the first and second part, we were able to center two important questions. Uh, The second that we left off with was, what does it mean for you and us to build something that has never been built before? And so in this convening, we centered the work of Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, and that was a guiding framework for this discussion and our multi-day convening. We spent our last few minutes of the discussion in part three addressing the third and final question uh, that was central to our entire dialogue on this day. Um, The question is, what does transforming higher education mean to you? And so I believe that this was an interesting question because elements of it came up in discussion throughout part one, part two, and part three. Um, But we kind of intentionally got to the question at the end of our time together. And as you know, dialogues and discussions, I mean, they're just free flowing. There's not really any need for them to be ordered any particular way. So I actually love that elements of responses and connections to this question are embedded in the comments of um, that were recorded in part one and, and part two as well. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to part one or part two of episode 31, no worries. You'll be able to uh, pick up where we are leaving off in this conversation in this final recording and feel free to carve out time to listen in to those other two parts at a time and pacing that feel good to you. And so if you'd like to uh, access the show notes that includes biographies and photos of this episode's guests, please visit the episode's webpage at resilientcampus.com forward slash 31.3. I will get out of your way for now, and I look forward to connecting with you soon. Enjoy the episode. This is S. You're making me think um, about accountability and assessment. This year, I would say like this idea of embodying the institutional constraints or embodying the institutional toxicity, like that started to happen to me in my current role. And it was just like seeping out in like ways that I was unaware of. And I think um, what really helped is having trans students in my life who were like, hmm, you talk to us a lot about breaking down hierarchies and all these other things. And yet this is how it's showing up and how we're working together. Right. And just like holding up a mirror to say, like, your spouse values are not aligning with your behavior and really taking some risks, I would say, because of these hierarchies within institutions to sort of like say that to my face. Right. And hold me accountable to sort of the ways in which I say I want to live and like how that's not living out. And so I'm also thinking about in this book, the assessment piece. So having people who are willing and able to hold you accountable and being willing and able to hold yourself accountable and assess kind of what's what's happening. And so as you were talking, I was thinking a lot about being grateful actually to folks who will say like, hey, I'm not sure if you recognize this, but like this is how you're showing up. And me being willing to put ego aside or whatever else might come up and really take notice and do something different. I have a question, right? Because you've talked a lot about hierarchies and it's kind of come up in some ways. And I'm curious, right? Because TJ brought this up in the beginning is that we've been able to, in some ways, dismantle hierarchies in this group. And I don't actually think that's true in a lot of ways. I think we're cognizant of the ways that those hierarchies control power and narratives of how this group moves. 
And I'm curious for you as, but also for the table, like what does it mean to be people who have to, even in this space and out of this space, navigate through the hierarchy that comes with the position? And what does that possibility of trans, does that possibility of trans thinking, possibility, envisioning, whatever, how does that play into where we are hierarchy wise? Right. Um, if that question makes sense to folks, because um, I'm I'm really curious as someone who's moving from a practitioner role into a doctoral student role, which means inevitably I'll have some three very lovely letters at the end of my name, which at an institution will give me either faculty power or, upper or admin level power in a way, which I think I don't want to have to have that hierarchy. And at the same time, that comes with this role. And I think in some ways we also are having to pull apart that messiness and I'm cognizant of it. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the yeah. The question that I'm sitting with is like, what does it mean to have to be aware of the hierarchies that are in this space, and also um, as trans, like in or uh, non, not in this non-space, what does it mean to have those hierarchies that we are having to navigate through, and how do we envision trans possibilities in that? So I was thinking about what TJ said as well about sort of the hierarchies dissipating, and I feel somewhere in between what TJ said and what you've said because I don't feel them in the room anymore. Right, and I'm trying to remember that feeling is a legitimate way of knowing, and it's not a thing that I really enjoy doing. So I don't feel them anymore, but I'm really aware of what Melvin said earlier is that like I'm trying to live here, but like tomorrow we go home. And even if I don't feel the hierarchies here, I will recognize them and live in them when I when I leave. And um, I think a lot about what Z has done for me as a doctoral student, which has been very much like a lift as you climb like that's how i perceive it and so it feels less hierarchical somehow i don't know if that makes sense to your question but that's where my brain went the critical connections feel like all of us deciding to do the lift while we climb thing mm. to create something somewhere else i mean higher is literally in the metaphor i'm using so i could use a different one but but do you know what i'm saying like it feels more like um multiverse connected ways of moving through hierarchies. This is DL. I, you know, and I didn't make this part of my introduction because it's less and less significant to me as I move forward. But I sit here, you know, in this group as a full professor, as going into my 19th year as a full-time faculty member with the start of this next academic year, as um, a literally having the designation of senior scholar um, attached to me. And so I, and I roll, I'm rolling my eyes as I say all this because it, it's, it just feels very performative in, in a lot of ways to, to walk in all of that. And it's very heavy in a lot of ways to walk in, to walk in all of that. Um, and even, you know, here, you know, jokes get cracked and, and whatnot, you know, at, about that and, and everything. Um, and what to me that represents is that, is that I've spent it's been almost half of my life learning how to function within a certain system and structure and um, navigate certain barriers and all of that bullshit. I've learned how to live in the bullshit. I've learned how to be the, um, there's a um, Aquarian animal that lives by virtue of the muck and the guck in the ocean. I cannot think of what the name of that, that creature is right now. And that, in a sense, is what I am. Like, I've been able to turn myself into that. And, and so I, I think that has had a deleterious effect on my ability to see otherwise and to be able to fully imagine. So, see, you talked about reclaiming the imagination of schooled out of you. I really, I feel that because I, you talk about schooled out, like, <laughs> add the 19 to the uh, however many years before that, you know, I've been doing school, you know, since I was three, right? I've been doing school for, you know, over 40 years. And I think that's one of the things that I value so much about being part of this group is that I get to be pushed on and compelled and challenged by folks who haven't been as contaminated as I am, right? And to be able to follow um, to, and want to, and, and to some ways, try to be able to just follow the lead of others around this table, because sometimes I have a really hard time imagining otherwise, you know. I know this is not it. Like, this is not the it. This is not exceptional. No. <laughs> but trying to get to the, so what, at, what then? What else then? What otherwise? It's really difficult. It's really difficult. 
Well, but I think what you're saying, right, your, and this is S, your willingness to be open to different ways of doing it, right? And I think that for me, that's part of what I mean when I talk about disrupting the hierarchies, because I know they exist, right? Like there's different roles on campus. I'm an instructor, you're a student, like that means something, but that doesn't mean I know more than you. That doesn't mean that your humanity is not valued. And I think that's what I try to do. It, it, when I think about disrupting and dismantling, I'm open to being wrong, right? I'm open to being called in. I'm open to a different way of doing things in ways that when I hear from students and they talk about other faculty members who are not willing to do that because of the hierarchy and because I am the professor and you are the student and this is why it is, and right? And so I feel like connected to my transness and being able to do gender differently, I'm like, I can do every fucking thing differently. Like nothing has to be the way that it, that it has been. And, and yes, it's scary sometimes because I'm like, what's going to be the repercussions of me sort of um, embodying this? Um, sometimes it backfires where uh, I might make a decision that, you know, maybe wasn't the best decision because I was trying to be like understanding and open. But for me, it's about learning from those things. It's about leaving that open space for those possibilities and recognizing the power and leveraging that power mm -hmm. in other spaces and ways. So, right. so knowing, you know, the students feeling like they can share with me what they need and me being able to go into other rooms and leveraging the power that I do have in those spaces towards those ends. So it's like, it's like using power in productive ways, I guess. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what I was referring to as well. And, um, and it speaks to a lot of how Adrienne Marie Brown talks about hierarchies, right? She, she doesn't pretend hierarchies don't exist. Right. Um, and, and she says, uh, at one point, uh, something along the lines of that she functions most comfortably in hierarchies, but that hierarchies don't have to mean what they currently mean in most oppressive dominant structures. And and I actually use the word dissolve, not dismantle, um, very intentionally because I was talking about making hierarchies more fluid, right? Uh, where folks can come in and out of decision-making uh, processes and leadership processes, right? Like the amount of decisions that I've had to make during these two days is so close to zero compared to, I think, past iterations of some convergences and gatherings or the in-between times where I felt uh, sort of the, the gaze of TJ, will you make a decision or Z, will you make a decision? Like that has, that's what has dissolved for me. Like I haven't felt that kind of pressure as much in, in these couple of days, like several times, like when people have asked me a question, I'm like, I don't know, you do it. Like I've, I've, I've like physically shrugged to be like, it's not my decision. And, and people have actually heard it. It hasn't just been like this, oh, you're putting me out to pasture and I don't know what to do now. But like people have been like, okay, cool. This isn't TJ's decision. I can take this, I can take this handle. I can make this decision. I'll make this call. And that was, that's been fine. Yeah. So this is Z. I'm, um, as I'm listening to folks talk, I'm thinking a lot about um, how I've been trying to learn how to be a thief. And um, I'm thinking a lot about um, Martin and Harvey's work around the undercommons in the university and this idea that like, for me, engaging with hierarchies has more and more meant how can I steal and redistribute? S was talking about like engaging with power and leveraging power. TJ's talking about dissolving. Um, like what are ways that I can, and Savvy made comment to like the realities of capitalism. Um, so what are the ways that I can engage in particular hierarchies to steal things, to then redistribute them in ways that allow us to exist in perhaps more comfortable spaces um, or to be able to imagine differently in some respects. Um, you know, like I, um, I don't think it's going to be any surprise to people around the table or to some folks listening who might know me that, um, you know, I, I seem to fit really well in the academy. Like being a faculty member, yeah, I know, TJ just gave me a face. Like being a faculty member is a really ideal job for me in a lot of respects with all of its messiness and all of its like fuckery. And I think more and more, is that okay? Can I say that on the pod? Um, I just did it. Um, I think more and more, especially over the last two years, I've really been thinking about like, how can I take from this system that we know to be toxic and that we know has never been created with and for us, how can I take from that and give in different kinds of ways? You know, and, and in ways that seem highly antithetical to all the other people out there who, who really don't matter right now. You know, like who don't matter to this space, who don't matter to, to what we wanna do. And, and in a lot of respects may not matter tons when we leave this space in some ways. Um, and so I think this space allows us to think about like, where might those people not matter when we're beyond this space? I think what um, all four of you have brought up 
again, that goes for me, and this is Alex, the critical connections piece that is so emphasized in the book um, that I think helps dissolve the hierarchies, that I think helps us connect with, with the folks who can hold the mirrors to us, that helps us think about why we want to be a thief. Because um, I think the other, the, the two sort of strands of thinking I've had is one I think we often talk about, or I often think about, dehumanization as only dehumanization and not also superhumanization and the ways in which, or the ways, let's try to get that out of my language, the ways, <laughs> how, how, <laughs> how um, I construct certain scholars and people and groups of people as superhuman also is a dehumanization tactic that makes me not see their liberation bound up with mine because I think they've already got there, right? Like I think about, I think on a group of people example, I think of um, more recently, black women who saved, in quotes, Alabama by electing Doug Jones when white women and men wouldn't do that, right? Uh, and voted for Roy Moore. But I think also how to the point DL made about not sharing titles, right? I think often, even in my pursuit of graduate education, applying to Bowling Green as a master's student, seeing DL as someone who was like this superhuman scholar who like, how could I ever relate, right? Like, and so... But that was me doing that, right? And so I think to side your question about these hierarchies, I think about how often it's not just that hierarchies dehumanize people in the sort of downward way, but also in the upward way that make me feel uh, an abdication of responsibility that I have to like intentionally name and take up again more intentionally. And I think that's related to this group, but also when I'm not physically present with this group, I think about how critical connections have been so important to subvert hierarchy in my own institution. It took me a year to remember I was a student again when I got into a doc program and I was like, oh, I can just go to a board of trustees meeting and say whatever I want again, right? Like I, I had to literally remember the agency that I was re-granted by being a doc student that I often think people think we lose when we become students and not faculty or staff members. And I was like, oh, I can go tell the president about himself and like, as long as I'm cognizant of the critical connection with my pre-tenure advisor and say, yo, just a heads up, this is probably going to happen when I see our dean in the hallway, I'm good, right? And that's because of a critical connection I feel that she'll have my back and I have her back, that I think is so important. And I wanted to go back to what you were saying just now, um, just before TJ, about, so BYP 100 and Movement for Black Lives you know, operate on this leader full mm -hmm. right, con concept and organization strategy. And I think to get to leader full communities, it requires folks who are, who are to refuse leadership. So when you don't answer a question, you're refusing the leadership, right? Which then requires someone else to come up with an answer. Right and act in that, and so there's the responsibility, and, and I often function in that when people expect me to to lead a group or to lead something, and I go, no, I actually don't. Think, no, I'm not going to do that. Right, and that requires then leadership to be developed someplace else, right, by multiple other people. Um, what Alex was talking about in terms of dehumanization as superhumanization, uh, it reminded me of a passage in Emergence Strategy. So I just wanted to read uh, Brown's words uh, specifically, to bring her back in. Um, Rocks, and this is page 99, um, rock stars get isolated, lose yeah. touch with our vulnerability, are expected to pull off superhero work, and generally burn out within a decade. Yeah. No one has time for rock star tears. Yeah. I've talked with other leaders who got bumped into rock star status as young organizers, and almost all of us share a few core experiences. People stopped seeing us. We became a place for reject longings and critiques. We lost touch with the fact that it's okay to make mistakes. Then we made the biggest mistake of our lives, and we learned the hard way that rock star status is a cyclical thing. It becomes its own work maintaining and promoting the rock star in the organization. And um, I think, DL, when you're talking about me refusing leadership, like this is what I'm trying to refuse, because I've been there. Um, I've, I've, I've been given this like rock star status that I didn't actually even have, but needed to be imposed on me in order for folks to throw critiques at me and for it to like stick so that they didn't have to see me as a person um, yeah, with, with feelings, with uh, tears or whatever. Um, and no one could then refuse their critiques, right? How did I know that that was even the page that you were going to read, right? Like page 99 fucked me up when I read it. And, and I think a lot of us either have been placed or I've, I've talked with Sai about this already, like will be placed in these particular roles and, and particular ways, which I think then becomes another press from the outside of like, well, what is it that you're doing here? Going back to this idea of like, what's the deliverable? What's the thing? What's the, 
teach us. You know, I, re I remember this um, this moment. I constantly talk about this moment from a dissertation research where the um, chief diversity officer was speaking at a um, LGBTQ center welcome, and uh, she's a non-trans straight person, and said, um, "We are so glad that you are here to teach us all that we need to know about gender and sexuality." Yeah, it was it was a different kind of messy. It wasn't like a productive good kind of messy. It was just like <laughs> booked messy. Yeah, um, it was like a get your girl kind of messy. Um, yeah, like. It, it was even happening to our youth who just wanted to be college students in that respect. Like sometimes it's not even about a quote unquote body of work. It's just about a body. Yeah. You know? yeah. I was literally about to not share that story, but just that similar thing of how trans students are more often than not made to be superhumans, yeah. to teach everyone about gender, yeah. um, to teach us the things that we don't even know we don't know about gender, as someone told me post-training, right? Like there's this thing that we, there's this move that happens where trans folks, and in some ways double-edged, like we are the experts on gender because we write our own, but then we have to do the act of teaching everybody else how to see our genders. And so it becomes this superhuman thing where we are both creating the knowledge of transness and how to be trans in education or as trans people. And then at the same time, what does that mean for us as people who lose their humanity in that process? And something that, that's a thing that we've all kind of mentioned is, is that we get to be here and just be present. And it was really moving from you as to say, you like got to go swimming and stay in the pool till you were wrinkled. And I think so often we don't get to do that physically, metaphorically, emotionally. We don't get to get wrinkled. We have to be smooth everywhere. And so what does that mean for our human, our humanity to not necessarily have to be a superhero to just be a person, right? Right. I'm a yeah. huge nerd, so like, like I, I live in the like Marvel verse is a thing where we talk about um, like what does it mean to be Black Panther? And we can talk about like the, the theorize around Black Panther and what does it mean to have vibranium suits and armor and all of these things that make people everyday people superheroes. And sometimes at the end of it, it's like I don't necessarily want to be a superhero. It's beautiful. I love those moments when I get to see my community thrive and shine and like get that moment. And also. I just want to go swimming. I want to stay in the pool. I want to, like, and I think that there's something to that about this space where we get to be fluid in that moment. I have literally been called a rock star, superstar, more times than I want to count. And it never feels humanizing and uplifting, ever. I remember, you know, tweeting, I'm going to tweet thread on the ways that people will craft relationship to me. When I say craft, I mean that intentionally because it's not, they have built something, <laughs> they have created something that does not actually exist. Um, you know, so this faux proximity. And someone responded, and I could hear the scoffing in the tweet. Um, oh, so it's not good to be, you know, an academic celebrity. Okay. And, you know, I responded, I was like, no. Like, you, that's, like, like, no, this is, celebrity is not something to achieve. So that's not humanizing. That does not allow for messiness to not always have it right to be imperfect. It means there's a stress, a pressure to show up as always smooth, um, to have no acne, right? And that's not real. That's not how human beings are. You know, and so one of the things I, you know, continually appreciate about being a part of this is that I don't have to walk in that. You know, y'all tease me about it all the time. And and I laugh. You know, you know, I just laugh about it. But I, I know I I know it's joking. I know it's that needling tease that is happening. And I don't have to, there's nothing I have to live up to to be a part of this group. And that's freeing. About transforming higher education as a process of poking holes in the walls of the academy so that it's as porous as it is in reality, like you can walk on and off campus, just walking around as like a regular human, you don't have to be a student, but we don't conceive of our work as that porous in our communities. And so I think, I think I just want to poke holes in the walls to let some of the messy out and to let some of the good stuff in and... I think that this is as relates to what I was thinking about, of like this idea of transforming higher education, like it, that that context is not the ending, right? Like maybe that's where we're positioned and that's where we do the work, but we actually have to transform all of our spheres of influence. In my group yesterday, I was saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. And so thinking about like, if we are committed to transforming higher education, then we are committed 
in a lot of ways to transforming the world, taking over the world, to use your worst deal. Um, and so I think for me, a lot of what I think about when I think about transforming higher education is how am I being with my family? How am I being with my friends? How am I being with the grocery store clerk, right? Like, how am I being with people? Because part of the transformation for me is like, how am I being with people at the school that I'm at or, or the institutions that I work with? So for me, it's like not just higher education is like a focal point. Small as all. Small as all. And again, critical connections, right? Uh, this is TJ. Like, I, I care less and less and less and less. Uh, like how many books you've written and how prolific your writing is and how brilliant um, your social justice analysis is, blah, 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 blah. Um, but like if I have to introduce myself for like the fifth time in this context and our our works are sort of in the same area and so maybe I feel like I should be a name you recognize at some level, then I, you don't matter, right? Like uh, th- that, that critical connection doesn't exist. And so those 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 are people for me that have become examples of who I don't want to be and why like that, that rock star status is like gross to me now. Um, and admittedly, it was a place I wanted to get to. Uh, I wanted to be an academic rock star. And now I see what academic rock stars actually do and, and feel like, and I'm just like not interested. Yeah, I mean, it feels like getting free. You know, like thinking about the, the small as all, like transforming higher ed is about like thinking about my freedom, our freedom, and pushing towards that. You know? If I'm to transform higher education deal, then that means how do I transform the class that I teach? How do I transform my relationship with my advisee? How do I transform how I show up in a service role? Small is all. That's the place where the change needs to happen, not up at the 30,000 foot view. Because then it's you're changing how you show up in those spaces. And when you have the power and the, the title and the role to change how the space is organized and structured, then you teach other people in those spaces that that is possible. And then they go, oh, I can, well, let me do this over here in this other space where I am, right? Um, and, it, and it spreads, you know, like this beautiful, wonderful, transformative contagion. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta poke holes in things to let stuff out. Let it breathe. So for folks that are listening into this episode, um, we at this at this gathering we have a, a schedule that we will continue to discuss these topics and perhaps there'll be other conversations to share with the the larger world and perhaps many of those conversations will stay here. And I think that we in the room are open to those possibilities and um, and making decisions about what we share of ourselves, both at this convening and just out in the world, um, when we can make those decisions, right? And so I wanted to just thank everybody, not only for this conversation, but just for our time together. It's just been such a wonderful experience for me. And I'm humbled that now we can share pieces of this experience and of your brilliance out into the world and that contagion. (laughs) So for each episode, um, I close out with an inspirational quote to send the listeners back out into the world. And today's quote comes from Adrienne Marie Brown. She says, I want a future where we are curious, interested, visionary, adaptive. To all those listening in, thank you so much for all that you do. I truly appreciate you. Stay resilient. Thanks so much for tuning in. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on a single episode.